All right. So, next unit, A3. The next unit of our A is for atoms is about the electrons. And today we're going to talk about the movement of electrons, that uh, quantum physics that we were talking about. We're going to talk about quantum science today. And then uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about this giant array of numbers. Does anyone know what this is? This is called an electron configuration, and it's really handy. It's kind of like an address. Just like if we had a Google photo of your neighborhood, you could point to your house and say, that is my house. If you had an overhead, a sky picture, you'd be like, yep, that's my house right there. But if you wanted Amazon to deliver you a package, what do you have to give them? Your address. Because they don't have a global world size Google image that can be like, show pick your picture out, pick your house out, that's your house. Well, similarly, we have the periodic table. And if I aim right at somewhere on the periodic table, you can tell me what that atom is. What is it? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. Okay. That's easy. I can point at an atom, you can be like, that's that one, that's that one. There's cadmium, there's phosphorus, there's chlorine. Down there, there's osmium. But another way to say where an element is, is with its address. And the electron configuration is its address. Because each atom in their ground state has a different number of electrons. And that number of electrons tells us where it will fall on the periodic table using its electron configuration. So this is what we're going to be doing on Wednesday. Today we're going to talk about the quantum part that's up here, and tomorrow we have a simulation. Are there any questions before we begin? Feel free to ask. Okay, then let us begin. There was this guy named Rutherford about, well, let's just go ahead and say 100 years ago. And uh, Rutherford studied electrons, among other things. He studied some nuclear particles. He studied electrons. And he was uh, from Great Britain. And he had a student who was Danish named Nels Bohr. Now, Rutherford had this idea, and it was pretty good, that all the electrons exist in one big shell, like the shields around the Starship Enterprise, one big shell of electrons. And inside that shell was the nucleus. If you remember from what we were talking about before, if the nucleus was a, beat as, was a tennis ball on the 50 yard line, where are the electrons? With the goalposts, right? That's a big empty atom. So that's the way Rutherford, he, Rutherford did some math. He's the one that gave us this idea about the 50 yard line and the goalposts. The nucleus sitting there on the 50 yard line, the electrons were one big shell at the goalpost. Well, his student Nels took up his work, and he looked at what happens when atoms get electrified. And what he found was really, really interesting. Electrons would be jumping up and down. So there couldn't just be one shell. There had to be what? Multiple shells. I need a volunteer. Nobody's going to volunteer? OK. Twins. Um, if you could just push your chair out and then stand up. All right. Now, um, Quinn is sitting or standing on the floor. We're going to call the floor the ground. Can he be any lower than the ground? Under his own power, could be any, could he be anywhere where he is right now? No. He is he is relaxed. He's at the lowest state. And we're going to call that the ground state. Say, Quinn, if you could step onto your chair, that would be great. OK. Now, he is no longer on the ground state. He's up a level. If we make the ground state, I don't know, 1, then he's currently where? Level 2. Okay. 
What do his muscles have to do to get them to level two? Yeah, they had to use energy. So in order to get from level one to level two, he had to use energy. Now, go to level three, if you will. Now he's at level three. So he was at level one, he got to level two by using energy, and he got to level three by using energy. Does this make sense? Now, if you could stand at level 2.4, well, you're still level three. Yeah. You can't do it, okay? There is no level 2.4. There's a level one, a level two, and a level three. Go ahead and have a seat, thank you very much. So electrons work the same way. They can exist at very specific, what we call discrete levels. They can be at level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, level six, level seven, but they can't be anywhere in between. They can be at very specific, specific levels. And they can jump levels. If a large spider was to crawl across the floor, some of you would immediately jump to level two. Be like, I'm not going to get that floor. Okay? And that's what electrons do. When electrons get energy, they jump. So the Bohr model has ex electrons existing in energy levels. Maybe level one, level two, level three, level four, and so on. But never in between. There's that handsome devil knelt for. So Nell's electrified atoms, various atoms, and he noticed that. They can jump up and jump down, but only very, very specific sizes of jumping. And they would only take in and give off very, very specific amounts of energy. And he called these amounts of energy quanta. Each packet of energy of a specific size is a quantum. Multiple packets are quanta. Kind of like stairs. The stairs are of a specific height. And you can be on one of those stairs, but you can't be anywhere in between. Electrons can be at any level, but they have to be on a level. They can't be anywhere in between. And here's the really crazy thing about quanta. Because they are a specific size and a specific location, and for reasons that we don't entirely know, if an electron jumps up one level by gaining four units of energy, if its quantum is four units large, and it takes a net quantum, and it jumps up to the next level, getting four units of energy, it doesn't stay there. It immediately jumps back down, giving off how much energy? That same four units. So it might jump up, taking in four, but when it comes back down, it'll give off those four. If it jumps up four and then jumps up again five, it has the option to give off nine, five, and four. Maybe it jumps up 20, when it comes back down, it's going to give out 20 in some combination. So there's seven levels it can jump to. Maybe I hit an electron with 10 units of energy, and it jumps up 10. Maybe it jumps down 10 in one jump, or maybe it jumps down 10 in seven jumps. But either way, whatever goes into an atom comes out. Really neat. <coughs> old light bulbs, old ones with a little filament, they have to get really hot, and that filament vibrates, producing energy. 
very, very inefficient, very inefficient, because it has to produce a lot of heat. You might have touched an old light bulb when you were younger. You'd be like, ow, that didn't feel good at all. Somebody should invent a light that doesn't produce a lot of heat. Well, they did. LEDs produce very, very little heat. And the reason they do is because they function on this quantum idea that whatever energy goes in comes out. Your cell phone can keep the, the screen lit for a very, very long time because it's functioning at the quantum level. The electricity that goes in produces light coming out. For every 10 units of electricity that goes in, 10 units of light comes out. Very, very efficient. Okay, does this idea make sense? Nod your head if you're with me. Okay, you guys are like pretty stoic, so it's tricky to figure out if, you're, if you know what's going on. Okay, so from the top, this is what happens. You have an electron hanging out in its ground state. It's happy, it's the lowest energy state. Saturday afternoon in the easy chair. Energy comes in. What happens to that electron? It jumps up. And it jumps up to what we call an excited state. Now it's like, woohoo, I'm excited. I got a lot of energy. This is like what happens when I give my toddler sugar. Da! But it doesn't stay there for very long, unlike my toddler. He stays hyper for quite a while. The electron does not stay excited for very long. In an infinitesimally small amount of time, it jumps back down. To us, pretty much imperceptible. Jumps up, jumps down instantly. It's really handy. So a moment later, in an infinitesimally small amount of time, that electron falls back down to its ground state. And what happens to that energy it was carrying? The energy is given off. So the energy is given off. Jump up by taking in energy, fall back down, give off that energy. That's the Bohr model. Now, there were some guys that came after Bohr, obviously, because this is a long time ago. Uh, there were some guys that came after Bohr by names of Schrodinger and Heisenberg. You may recognize those names. Nothing to do with the drug trade. That's why what you see in TV shows. Uh, and those guys refined this idea. And they said, not only are there levels, there's probabilities. If you take advanced chemistry or advanced physics in college, you'll learn all about the Schrodinger waves, wave equations. They require a calculus. Way beyond the scope of this course, but kind of fun. If you're interested in quantum, it's not as hard as everybody thinks it is. But it's kind of neat. You just, just Google Schrodinger wave equation or Heisenberg quantum. You'll learn all sorts of crazy things. OK. Here's the deal. We talked about, or I talked about, Electrons gaining energy and jumping up. Well, it turns out that if I send in electrical energy, maybe electrical energy comes out. But maybe light energy comes up. If I shine light energy in, maybe electrical energy comes out. Maybe light energy comes out. So the amount of energy is set by the quantum, but not the type of energy. Kind of interesting. So your cell phone works by taking electrical energy into the little cells and sending the LEDs and LCDs and sending out light energy. Pretty handy. That's called absor atomic absorption or emission. And all light energy is not the same. So atomic absorption happens when atoms take in energy and the electrons jump up, getting excited.
after the electron takes in the energy, what do they do? They take in energy, gobble, 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 and they're excited. Do they, say, do they stay excited for a long time? No, they immediately fall down. And that's called emission. Atomic emission <coughs> occurs when those electrons come back down to their ground state, releasing energy. very, very hot. Red stars, yellow stars, not very hot. That idea is very similar to ideas that we see in atomic absorption and emission. The light that comes out, the colors that come out, are based upon how much energy that photon is carrying. A photon is a little burp of energy. So when the electron jumps up and jumps down, burp, it burps out energy in the form of a photon. You might think of a photon as like a laser beam. Okay. So a blue photon bounce, 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 comes from electrons that jump up and jump down very, very fast. And a red photon comes from an electron that goes bounce, bounce where the electrons jump up and jump down very, very slowly. Approximately. This is a model. The important thing to realize is not all photons have the same amount of energy. Some photons have a lot more energy than others. Blue photons generally have higher energy. Red photons have lower energy. So let's pretend that you have an electron sitting at level one, and you give it that four units of energy, causing it to rise to level two. Then you give it five more units of energy, causing it to rise to level three. Well, let's say the transition between level one and level two, that four units, that might give off a red photon. And that five units of energy from level two to level three, that might be a yellow photon, slightly higher in energy, slightly closer to blue. Maybe when that electron comes down, it jumps down the entire nine units of energy, giving off a blue photon. Does that idea make sense? So I give it some energy. Maybe I give it blue light. Maybe I give it electricity. The electron goes level one to level two, level two to level three, and then it has the option of going from 3 to 2, 2 to 1, or 3 to 1. If it goes 3 to 2, then 2 to 1, it'll be given off the yellow light and the red light. If it goes 3 to 1, it'll give off the blue light. So the bigger the drop, the higher, the more energy in the drop, the more energy and the more energy in the photon, the more closer to blue it will be. The lower energy photon will be closer to red or yellow. Question? Uh, if a 
Um, because the lower ones are filled up. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And we'll investigate that on Wednesday when we look at electron configurations. Um, the Aufbau principle tells us, remember that Aufbau principle, that electrons want to be as low as possible, but if those low shells were already filled up, the electron will be like, oh, I guess I have to be in level two. <coughs> level one's already filled up. I'll just go to level two. Other questions? All right, moving on. Moving on. You don't need to write this down. This is just really cool. Um, now, realize there is a lot of math in quantum chemistry. You don't need to do any of it. Okay. According to the, the, the uh, standards you have to learn, you need to know about it, but you don't have to do the math. So these are the formulas, and we'll, we'll confuse the formulas later. If you take physics and physics AP, then we'll do the math. But for now, just realize how it works. This is the electromagnetic spectrum. This, dot, this uh, GIF, or this JPEG, is from the ALS, and it's the same as that on the wall. The ALS is the Advanced Light Source Lab from Berkeley, California. I was there about 10 years ago. And uh, I got that poster, <laughs> it was kind of cool. Um, it's one of, the early, it was one of the earliest atom smashers from the 50s and 60s. Neat, anyway. Anyway, so the electromagnetic spectrum shows all frequencies and wavelengths, all types of light. The visible light coming through the window, that's light. Here's what's really goofy. The radio waves that your cell phone picks up and the radio waves your cell phone emits, also light. You can't see it, but it's light. The infrared light that we are all emitting because we're warm, is light. We can't see it, but it's light. Your cell phone picture, your, your cell phone can see it. The remotes, the, your TV remote, have you ever pointed your TV remote at your cell phone camera? It's really fun. So at the end of the day today, go home and get your, your TV remote and point it at your cell phone camera and you'll see it blink. Because you can't read the infrared signals your cell phone, your, your uh, TV remote sending out, but your cell phone can and it doesn't know what to do with it, so it makes a little white light. Um, your remote control functions by sending out blips of light very quickly. So maybe, uh, a, it's like, like Morse code. Remember Morse code is like dashes and dots? Beep, 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 that's Morse code. Basically the same thing's going on with your TV remote, only a lot faster. So maybe beep, 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 beep means turn on, and beep, 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 beep means turn up the volume. That's how it works. It's sending out little blips of infrared light. But we can't see that. Some insects can, which is actually kind of cool. Some birds can see ultraviolet. It's all light. Radio waves that are the size of, well, your hand, all the way to the size of a city, that's a radio wave. It's all light, but really, really long waves. Microwaves tend to be a little bit smaller, from a, a couple centimeters to a half of a millimeter, really small. And then infrared, smaller than that. And this tiny little slice right there, that's what we can detect. That's what our eyes can detect, this tiny little slice right there. It'd be really neat if we could see into the infrared or the ultraviolet without a computer. We can with computers. Night vision goggles, you can have infrared goggles that read the infrared and translate it into visible light like your cell phone camera. Kind of neat, you can see in the dark. Ultraviolet, X-rays, you all know, know about X-rays, and then gamma rays. It's all light. Here's also crazy. All of this light from the X-rays that go right through your hand, into your bones, to the radio waves your cell phones are sending out, they all travel at the exact same speed. This number is important, and this concept is important. Three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. It all moves that fast. No matter what it is, from visible light that we can detect, to x-rays that go right through us, to cosmic rays and gamma rays, it all travels at three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 300 million meters per second. And this is, by the way, this is not only called the electromagnetic spectrum, it's called the continuous spectrum if you see all the visible light. 
Hey, questions about this stuff? It's kind of neat. I think it's really neat. Now, here's the formulas that you don't need to use. You just need to know they exist. Okay. So, there are two things. A wave has speed. Here's a great thing. All speeds of all electromagnetic waves are the same. But in that speed, they have wavelength and they have frequency. So these waves are all traveling the same speed. The little blue one goes bounce, 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 bounce. And the big yellow, big red one's going bounce, bounce, bounce. They all have the same speed, but not the same wavelength and not the same frequency. This crazy little TP symbol, does anyone know what that's called? Nope. The TP. It's called a lambda. 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 And it represents the wavelength of the wave. How wide the wave is, or how long the wave is, if you will. So that crazy little TP is lambda. It represents how long the wave is, the wavelength in meters. And if lambda, that TP is lambda representing wavelength, what is F? Frequency. In your own words, what is frequency? How many times something happens. Yeah, exactly. How often something occurs. Frequency is how many waves per second. Frequency is how many waves per second. Now, if you know your math, and you all do, then you know if you have two variables equaling a constant, then if one variable increases, the other variable must what? Decrease. Decrease. So we say they are inversely related. As wavelength increases, frequency decreases. Notice the red has a long wavelength, but a very slow frequency. Bounce, bounce, bounce. And the little one has a tiny wavelength, but a high frequency. Bounce, 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 bounce. So, additionally, energy varies with frequency. High frequency waves tend to carry high energy. Low frequency waves tend to carry low energy. And again, that's really all you need, math. If you take physics AP, which many of you will, um, I strongly recommend it, then we can actually throw the numbers at it. When you're seniors and you've got lots and lots of math, you will find it actually pretty easy. You can do it at this level if you want to. But for now, at this level, just realize high energy, high frequency. Long wavelength means low frequency Therefore, low energy. Because the, the red guy is just kind of bounding along. Boom, boom. The, the blue guy is going boing, 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 boing. All right, questions? If there's no questions, we're moving on. We're moving on. Okay. Now, hydrogen has one electron. Just one. That electron is hanging out in level one most of the time. But if you zap hydrogen, what's that electron going to do? <coughs> it's going to jump up. It could jump up to two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And when it's in any of those levels, it can jump back from, jump back from seven to five, 5 to 3, 6 to 4, 6 to 1, 7 to 1, 7 to 6. It has the option of jumping to any of those levels. 
So an atom absorbs energy, then returns to their ground state. It gives off energy called an emissions spectrum. Very specific bands of energy representing very specific quantum. Quantum. That's a quantum, and that's a quantum, and that's a quantum, 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 quantum. Very specific bands of energy representing very specific sizes of energy, very specific quantum. Quantum. That is the emission spectrum for hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't have a lot of options. It only has one electron to move around. We're going to investigate this idea in, uh, in a lab tomorrow. The idea that when you energize atoms, they give off visible light. Now, because of this, because each atom has a different number of electrons in their ground state, and because each electron can jump at different levels, each atom has a very specific quantum fingerprint. Hydrogen will look different than helium. Helium will look different than lithium. Lithium will look different than beryllium, and so on. Each atom has a very specific quantum fingerprint, and it's different. So what we do is we record the quantum fingerprints of atoms as we discover them. Just like if we fingerprint all of you, we will match your fingerprint to you. We will match the quantum fingerprint to an element. science fiction at some point flying away from Earth, settling on a colony light years away. But we're looking for Earth-like planets. We want Earth-like planets. We want planets that have oxygen in their atmosphere. We want planets that have an atmosphere. How do we know when we've found one? Even simpler, take this. We've never gone to Jupiter and scooped up a sample of Jupiter and brought it home. We've never even crashed a, a, a spaceship into Jupiter's atmosphere. It would, we'd have a lot of trouble with that. But this is how we know what Jupiter is made out of. We look at starlight really far away. And we know starlight should look a certain way. And as that starlight passes through Jupiter's atmosphere, it changes. And we look at the changes. For instance, if you closed your eyes and someone put a pair of sunglasses over your eyes and you opened your eyes, you're going to know you have sunglasses on, right? Because everything's going to look darker. What if somebody put like a green filter over your eyes, like studio filter or you know a colored filter, and you opened your eyes and you're like, whoa, everything is green. You're going to know that everything is green, and you're going to infer someone put something green over your eye. We do the same thing with Jupiter, or gases, with planets. We know what, they, uh, what they're made out of because we know their quantum fingerprint. Okay. Here's, uh, here's some bright line emissions. You don't need to write anything down here. It's actually kind of interesting. Um, there's sodium. Sodium produces a yellow light. You know where you see sodium light? Street lamps. Street lamps are sodium light. They produce kind of a yellowy light. Um, because sodium has red, 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 orange, yellow, green, green, blue, 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 blue. But this orange and yellow band are very, very bright, very pronounced. So sodium looks like yellow. Sodium has 11 electrons to play with. Mercury has 
80 electrons to move around. So mercury can make lots of bands all over the spectrum. Where do you see mercury light? Hmm, yeah, sometimes. Hopefully not because they're slow. But uh, anyone ever turn on the lights in a gymnasium? They take a long time to turn on. Mercury lights are usually used in gymnasiums. When we don't really care about the quality of light, we just want it to be very, very bright. Mercury is a really good way to go. They also last a very long time. But if you break a mercury light, you got to get out of the, out of the building because mercury is poison. It sticks in your brain for a long time. That's a big problem for those of you who are, whose brains are still developing. You realize your brains are still developing, and they'll keep developing until, they, until your early 20s. Yeah. So we don't want to get things in the way of that. But mercury has 80 electrons to play with. That's mercury spectrum. So basically, there are so many bands with mercury, mercury appears to be what color? Rainbow. You put all the rainbows together and you get? White. That's Newton's prism. Yeah. So all those colored bands mix together to look like white light. When you're in the gymnasium, you look up, you'll be like, hey, look, that light is producing white light. It's actually not. It's producing lots of bands that your brain squishes together to produce white, to look like white light. Question? No, I just mean when you put all the color together, it's like one black. Color. Yeah, because you're putting together pigments, not light. Yeah, take physics, you'll learn about the difference between pigments and light. That's called, an, that's called a subtractive color. These are additive colors. Okay, so the absorption spectrum is what you get when you shine white light through a gas. Shine white light through a gas, and you get everything except what the gas absorbs. This is how we know what Jupiter's made of, or Saturn, or Neptune, or those really far away planets from stars millions of light years away. We just look at them, and they look different colors. Just chunks of the spectrum have been removed. Guess what element this is? I can read it on the board too. Very few bands. Hydrogen. Yeah, hydrogen. Uh, again, if you look at, if you shine white light through hydrogen, this is what you would see. You'd be like, hey, hydrogen absorbs that quanta, or quantum. Hydrogen absorbs that quantum. Hydrogen absorbs that quantum. Hydrogen absorbs that quantum. So the bands represent quantums that the atom has absorbed. And we see everything else. Questions? All right, cool, we're done. So we'll pick up, um, we'll do this in a lab tomorrow, and then we'll pick up electron configurations on Wednesday.